next thing I know, the guy had actually dove through the passenger door back into the driver's seat, and we ended up kind of face-to-face -face with him. My partner was on the, the back side of that vehicle, did not realize the vehicle had been occupied. It was still running. Um, I saw him put it in reverse, looked at us, looked over his shoulder, and punched it. Uh, White smoked his, his uh, tires towards my partner, who's behind him. Shot first, shot first. With 221, what's your location? Hey there, self-defenders. John Korea is proud to be an ambassador for Heckler & Koch pistols. The entire active self-protection team loves our HKs, knowing that we can drag them all over the country, shoot thousands of rounds a year through each one, subject them to very little care, and they will always go bang. Incredibly reliable and a joy to shoot. Please visit them at hk-usa.com, hk-usa.com, and tell them the Active Self-Protection Podcast sent you. All right, gang, welcome back to the Active Self-Protection Podcast. I am your host, Mike Williver, your favorite former fed with us today is a retired fort worth police officer of 17 years david riggle uh, he is married with four kids and resides in the great state of texas and i appreciate you coming on david how are you sir i'm great how are you i'm doing well we're on here today to talk about a critical incident that you had in the past you've had more than one uh, but there's one in particular we're going to discuss and i like to tell my guests that um well, I don't do a lot of pre-interview because I like to be learning about the incident at the same time they are. And I find that I can ask better questions if we haven't talked for an hour or two beforehand. So uh, I'll okay. be learning about this along with you folks at home. So let's start with uh, uh, personal life. You you grew up in Texas. Are you from there originally? Uh, born in West Texas, but grew up in the DFW area. Okay. Dallas-Fort Worth. I know it well. Did you grow up in a law enforcement family or military family or is this, are you like first generation Ellie? No, I'm the first generation. Um, actually, my family is kind of against the idea of going into law enforcement just because of the stress and all this and that. I'm, I've just wanted to do it since I was a child. And um, I, I played around a little bit until I was about 30. I was an old rookie. Um, I hired on at the age of 30. So Yeah, that is, that is old that is old to start. What did you do prior to Ellie? Um, you name it, I've done it. Um, I did a lot. I did some sales stuff. I worked for the airlines. Uh, I was actually a school teacher for one year, um, just trying to trying to find my niche. I did a lot of security and loss prevention type work. So I kind of was drawn to this from the beginning. What year did you start with Fort Worth PD? Uh, 2003 is when I hired on. I actually got commissioned in 2004. So back then it was still very competitive. I know now they're having a hard time filling slots, but back then it was still very competitive to get into LE if I recall correctly. Uh, I believe they had about 2,500 um, that applied for uh, 45 positions when I went through. Yeah, that so. sounds about right. When I started with the feds, I think it was 600 applicants for every every uh, job they had available. So it was, it was crazy nice. back then. Uh, now they're having a hard time. Like I said, they're having a hard time filling spots at all. They just can't get qualified candidates. They can make it through all the phases of the uh, hiring process. So uh, hopefully that will turn around. If we start maybe um, being a little kinder to our law enforcement officers, that might, that might be a change. My son's trying to get into LE right now and we, we'd rather he didn't in this current environment, but you know, that's what he wants to do. So talk to us about the training for Fort Worth. Does Fort Worth PD have its own uh, academy or is it a regional or shared academy or how does that work? No, they have a, a dedicated academy there. Um, there's actually a $99 million facility. It's a police and fire shared. It's a somewhat new facility. It's it's changed a little bit over time, but the, the training that I went through back in 2003, um, it was, I would not say it was easy. Um, it was eight and a half months long. Um, a lot of studying. Was, I'm a, I've got a bachelor's and I, I would equate it to studying like you would in college. Um, along with a lot of physical, um, they broke three or four of my ribs the first week. Um, and, uh, you know, I was blind for about two days when I got pepper spray. I mean, it was, it was, it was rough, but it's all very, very necessary, um, for, for what we're doing, especially what the guys are doing today. You mentioned the, the caliber of officers that are coming out as a trainer. I've seen, um, that change quite a bit over time. It's gone up and down a little bit. And I would say right now it is very hard to find good candidates to come through. Um, when people see me and say, thank you for your service, I say, I appreciate that. Now go think a rookie. Um, they signed up at, during wartime. I mean, this is a, this is not a great time to be an officer. So um, the guys that are out there doing it right now, I really, really respect and appreciate them for what they're doing. Yeah. You know, a lot of my, uh, I retired last year and the last few years of my career weren't really in the field. It was more, you know, wiretap, you know, office work kind of stuff. So um, right. I, you know, it, it's never been easy to be LA. It's never been like, it wasn't a time when everyone loved the cops, you know what I mean? But right right, right now it's so over the top, but I can't imagine just trying to do your job 
uh, with a simple contact on the street uh, where three or four people are going to interject themselves into that into that stop with cameras and yelling insults at you. It's just absolutely right. crazy. And right. I, like I said before, I really hope that that turns around uh, in in the near future. So, talk to us about the um, firearms training with your agency. Would you uh, would you say it was sufficient? Would you say it was enough? Or did it get you to get you through what you went through? It was. Um... Eventually, it was enough. In the academy, um, they've got four or five guys watching a line of 45 people. Oh, boy. Um, and to develop muscle memory, they're putting us through about 2,000, 2,500 rounds during the police academy. But it's very hard to keep quality control on that many people. I would say I was an average to, to a pretty decent um, shooter at that point. The the difference in when I moved into tactical operations and started working, you know, going through SWAT school and doing things like that, you learn a different style of shooting. Um, and I had already been through some of that before I was actually involved in, um, my, my day behind the trigger. So it, it does morph and it's like any other job you're going to get out of it, what you put into it. Um, I, I decided to take a route to, to go through some more training and, and the additional training from the more specialized trainers was definitely a benefit to me when it mattered. Um, same thing we see in civilian life, you can go get your license to carry in your state and shoot your, 50 rounds, it hits the side of a barn and you're good and ominous dominance you carry for the rest of your life. That's not sufficient training for mm. a civilian. But we also see, we own a gun range, but we see a lot of people who come through and they are just, they really dedicate a lot of time into training. Um, so it, it's going to make them better when it really, really matters. Um, you're never going to know on the day that you're shooting at something other than a piece of paper, how you're going to feel. So um, that training um, element is so so important. I like to say I've said it on the YouTube channel a few times and on on this in this space as well that whether you're a private citizen or a law enforcement officer or a member of the military in a combat unit, that you need to have had a conversation with yourself in your own head long before a critical incident ever happens. If you're going to be armed and interacting with people, you need to have had a, a made a decision in your head that you are willing to potentially take another human being's life. That right. you personally will will pull a trigger and kill another human being in order to protect your life and the lives of others, and I feel like uh, there's unfortunately there's quite a few people, both civilian and uh, and LE, that just kind of wish it away and hope it never happens yes. and don't really have that conversation. Would you say that you had had that conversation in your head prior to your incident? Uh, I'd had that conversation with my partner within the week before that incident, um, and it's it's a uh, it's one of those things we call it facing the dragon, and you never know how you're going to respond when you face the dragon. I think if you ask most people, um, could you pull the trigger when it matters? Most people would say yes and believe it at the time, but it's very hard to know um, where what you're going to do in that moment. Um, we we really like stress training, uh, stress inoculation training, because um, I know I've heard you guys, I've heard John say the uh, the body can't go where the mind hasn't been, mm -hmm. and I, I believe that 100 percent to be true. Um, I'm a very big advocate of stress inoculation or, or scenario training, something that inflicts pain when you mess up. Right. Um, not just, you know, not just doing jumping jacks and that, that does help for sure. It gets your heart rate up, but it's a different type of stress. You're not going to deal with the um, fine motor skill diminishing and those types of things that you're going to feel when you actually have a gun pointed back at you. Um, so yes, I think a lot of people will consciously say, yes, I can do it if I need to. Um, I personally had been in a couple of incidents where I, would have been very justified in shooting someone and something else happened. Somebody got a taser in there. Um, and it got to where I started to question myself. Can I, you know, I said I could do this, but can't I really do it when it matters? Because twice now I could have, and now I got to worry about that guy coming after me and looking over my shoulder because I didn't uh, neutralize him on the day when I probably should have. And I started kind of second guessing me and my partner talked about it. Um, to the point where when it actually did happen and it, it was kind of uh, it happened pretty quickly and afterwards instead of feeling kind of freaked out and remorse or regret i actually felt a sense of relief because i had just answered my own question yes if i need to do this i do have it in my in my um, personality to defend myself or defend my partner if i have to it's uh it's one of those things that we see officers uh, I was actually just watching a video. We run through some of the uh, ASP videos with our guys to debrief. Um, There's one that you guys showed not long ago where um, an officer had retreated, retreated, retreated. Please, please don't, please don't. It was yeah, in Oklahoma. Uh, yes. Um, and we we make the guys look through that. And that breaks my heart because I know that's a good person. I know he's a good guy. 
um, he went through something and he learned something about himself that night, I hope. And that was, I might've just wasted the last couple of years of my life to get to where I am, but I really need to gut check and decide, do I need to be doing this anymore? And I've seen that um, with, with multiple agencies that I've worked with where people have been had that conversation of, should you really be doing this? I know it sounded great when you started, but is this really, is this really for you? And especially with the climate today. You mentioned earlier, you've been on some specialized units. Walk us through that. You've been on uh, some kind of tactical team or, or what was that? So we did, um, yes, I've been on a couple, uh, the way Fort Worth is laid out, they've got a SWAT team um, that is a dedicated SWAT team. They don't, they're not subject to calls for service or anything. Um, and back, they've changed things now. Um, budgets have changed things around, but they had a unit called, when I started, it was called Zero Tolerance and then uh, SRT. Um, and it was a tactical response team, but it was more of a 24 hours um, type, of re- type of team. And I loved working there because we would get called when the call was happening. It wasn't a, you know, go shave, you know, shower, put your uniform on and go to work. And two hours later you get there, it was, we're getting there where the smoke's still in the air. And I love that type of environment. Mm-hmm. Um, I love the guys that I work with, tight group of guys. Um, I spent a majority of my career on that team. I'm not even really sure what it's called now. I retired last year as well. And then I moved into the gang unit, which is also part of tactical operations, but it was more of an administrative type position. Um, I was behind the scenes working with kids directly. So, And that's where I spent most of my career. Yeah, I worked gangs uh, for uh, 10, 12 years, I think, in the middle of my career. And that's the most fun I've ever had in my life. Absolutely, a, a <laughs> absolute blast. Uh, you know, it really, frankly, intimidating people who intimidate good people. Uh, that's right. kind of how I put it, you know, making them, right. putting a little fear of God into people who like to uh, harass and abuse and uh, victimize uh, citizens who are just trying to go about their go about their lives. Right. That's what, yeah, we called it turning predators into prey. Mm, um, I like it. There was a one particular incident where you... Uh, you alluded to earlier where you had to pull the trigger on someone. Uh, can you walk us through that, uh, starting with how you ended up where you were and just kind of, kind of walk us through it. Sure. Um, I'll give you kind of the cliff's notes version that, um, the team that I was on, we were both, both uniform and plain clothes and we had, it was a Saturday and we had received some intelligence that there was a bounty hunter with, a, I believe a pedophile that he had kind of cornered, um, called us in to go ahead and make the arrest, which we did. We went and spooked him out of a bar and grabbed him at the front door and put him in the car. Well, I was in the unmarked vehicle with three other officers. Uh, we were in uniform, but in a plane vehicle. And as we were going back to the office, um, a shooting came out not far from us. And we decided to go supplement patrol and go see what was going on with that shooting. And as we're driving, we see a vehicle um, kind of dodging traffic. Every time you'd see red and blues, he'd take a side street and obviously just, just doesn't look right. Something's mm-hmm. off about this guy. And we thought, well, that's probably our suspect. He's coming from that area. He's obviously hiding from the police and turning off his lights and doing that kind of thing. So we started to just kind of follow him and he realized we were following him and we, he, he kind of took off on us a little bit. So we called for um, some support with some marked units to go ahead and make that stop and take over primary on it because we we're not in a police car. And he ended up at kind of a dead end, kind of got blocked. Um, we ended up nose to nose with him. And I noticed that the passenger door on his vehicle, which was opposite us, was open. And I thought, well, they must have bailed out and run. There's a train yard right there. And I said, well, I guess they ran off and ran for the train. Um, what I believe he was doing was throwing a gun away um, now. But at the time, we didn't know where he was. So me and one other officer ran to the front of his vehicle. Uh, my partner had, was in the car with us. He had run to the back of the vehicle, just kind of running around it to look to see where is this guy going up the passenger door. And next thing I know, the guy had actually dove through the passenger door back into the driver's seat, and we ended up kind of face-to-face with him. Um, my partner was on the, the back side of that vehicle, did not realize the vehicle had been occupied. Uh, the guy it was still running. Um, I saw him put it in reverse, looked at us. Um, I had what's called the glass assault tool on my uh, on my pistol. So I, I punched the window out so that we could get a clear view of what was going on inside. Um, he looked right at us, looked over his shoulder and punched it. Um, uh, white smoke his, his uh, tires towards my partner who's behind him. Um, at that point, realizing that he was about to get run over, uh, myself and the officer next to me, um, both fired into the, uh, the front windshield of the vehicle. And we both, we both struck him once. Uh, my partner at that point realized he heard what was going on and jumped off the tracks. Uh, as the car went by, he actually fired into the vehicle as well. And he also struck him. So all three officers actually, um, struck the suspect one time. 
at this point he kept driving down the street and I thought there's no way we missed him from 10 feet away but I guess we did because the vehicle's still going well it was a dead man driving um he hit a mailbox um, spun out rolled out the the door and, and was deceased probably within a few seconds after that so I think a lot of times people will watch video badge cam or dash cam video of of a shooting uh, or or just someone bailing out of a car running from the police and they'll 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 question why the police are so jittery about clearing the car why that's mm-hmm. such a big deal to clear the car is because in a dynamic situation you might think you know you, you can't be you can't give 100% attention to the vehicle the whole time you're getting out and you're throwing it in park and you're jumping out of the car and you might think as you guys probably thought oh he's bailed out and he's running uh, and then all of a sudden, lo and behold, he's actually still in the car. So that clearing of the car is a critical part of, of, of a stop. Even if it looks like everyone's bailed out, even if it looks like there's no, no one left in the car, someone could be in that car and they could hurt you if you're not paying enough attention. So backing up just a moment to the moment that he put it in gear and that white smoke starts to, you know, he's, he's right. completely punched it at this point. Right. What's the first thing that went through your head? For me, it's kind of a weird thought. For me, it was, I don't want to shoot through this vehicle and hit my partner behind it because I knew I'd seen him go through there. Um, and we saw the guy jump back into the vehicle. Like we saw the motion of him going back across the vehicle. And I thought from his position, he didn't see that. I know he didn't see him get in the vehicle. So where is he standing? I can't see him. And bullets do weird things going through vehicles. Um, so it was, I actually only fired three rounds. Um, the, uh, my gut thought was make sure you don't shoot your partner. And at the same time, if this guy runs him over, I need to get medical on him as quickly as possible. Um, once I saw that he was okay, obviously the focus changed. So let's get this guy. But that was the first thing I thought was don't, don't put this guy in the middle of the crossfire and shoot your own partner. Yeah. And you, you mentioned the, those two things went through your head and that, that, two things that went through your head probably took less than half a second. Did you experience the sensation of time slowing down or events slowing down? Okay. Absolutely. Um, I've experienced that before as well. Um, but in that particular instance, it felt like an eternity. Yes. I heard recently, uh, another, um, another guest on the show said that, and I, I can't cite the source, so don't quote me, but it made sense. What he said was that, uh, people who are very well trained in tactics and in shooting and, and all that sort of thing who are well trained, they will experience the sensation of time slowing down people who are not trained at all or poorly trained or don't feel confident in their abilities, they'll actually get the sense that things are speeding up. Um, really? Yeah. And we, we, and I wish I had a source. I'll have to get back with that other guest <laughs> and ask him where he heard that, but it kind of makes sense. You're in the training world. Uh, I think it makes sense that if you, if you feel confident and you feel confident in your skills and abilities and tactics uh, in your marksmanship, then yeah, I think your, your brain's like, okay, we're ready for this. Let's, what do we need to do? What are my considerations? And all those thoughts can happen right. in, in a split second. Talk to us about post shooting. This guy, now you're, you've just fired three rounds. Your partner's fired a number of rounds. Do you check on your partner first? Do you check on yourself to make sure you're, you're not injured? And then wh- wh- where do you go from there? Cause you gotta go address this guy living or dead. You have to deal with him. Right. Well, post shooting was actually probably more stressful than during um because at the time we didn't know if he was still armed we didn't know if he was i mean the weapon he tried to use against us was a vehicle um we hadn't seen any gun yet um and as we approached a lot of people were showing up and it became again a crossfire it became a very heated situation just between the officers and we're all yelling at each other um if you've ever been in that situation you start experiencing things like ocular occlusion and auditory exclusion and things like that um, and just trying to listen to my team lead who had made the scene take control, um, that that seemed like it took an eternity. And like you said, it was probably a couple of minutes. Um, so it was very, that to me was the scarier time was once we had actually neutralized him, but we weren't really sure what was going on. Um, the moments after that, once we actually had secured the scene, um, actually went very smoothly, I thought. And I will credit that to my department, um, the training that they, they set with us and how they put us in. I mean, you want to talk about being in shootings. I was in a shooting every week because we do reality training every week. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's the night before the training is when you're the most stressed. But well, what are they going to hit me with tomorrow? And once you really get into it, once you do get inoculated to it, it, um, it almost becomes comfortable, so to speak. Um, never, never to the point of um, 
taking anything for granted because we're always looking for what are they going to throw at us next. But in those, in that post moment before it was hundred percent secured between bang and the time that we actually had handcuffs on this guy um, was probably the most stressful time of that night. You know, you mentioned ocular occlusion and auditory exclusion. I think these are things that you and I both understand completely what that means, but uh, we have a lot of listeners and I assume many of them are not law enforcement and don't have that kind of training. So just talk to the audience for a minute about what those two things are and what they were like for you in, during your incident. Okay. Um, ocular occlusion, um, and this is caused, it's the, it's the way God designed our bodies. It's a, it's a redirection of blood flow to the survival parts of your body. Um, and things like your eyes and ears are not um, survival mechanisms. So ocular occlusion is when the, your field of vision narrows down as if you're like looking through a coffee stir or looking through a, a, a straw where you can't see anything peripherally. Um, it becomes a big concern in law enforcement because people see things like a gun and shoot towards the gun, don't realize it's a security officer or a police officer behind that gun. And the more stress that you're feeling, it's like the tighter that that coffee stirrer gets. Uh, we get a lot of people with robberies that can dis- they can describe the gun to us perfectly, mm-hmm. but not the person behind the gun because they were staring at the gun and they were so focused on that. Um, auditory exclusion, um, there is something called inclusion. It's it's rare. My partner experienced it once, but auditory exclusion is where you basically can't hear. Um, everything sounds very muffled. Um, in this particular incident, I had uh, 12 rounds fired over my shoulder. I mean, the gun was probably 18 inches from my ear. Um, it was a 40 caliber and I couldn't hear it. I mean, I could hear it sound like a little pop gun down the street. Um, no hearing loss, no long term. Um, that's again something that unless you've experienced it, you it's it's really kind of a weird um, a weird thing to to feel. And the only time you're really going to feel that is when it happens. Um, it's important that people understand those things. When I teach classes, I tell people, you know, if you're trying to move somebody out of off the X and out of danger, you might have to put your hands on them because if they're scared, they're not going to hear you. They're not going to hear you barking orders at them. Or they're not trying to be disrespectful. And they're not, they're scared. So they can't hear you. Um, so those are the, those are two of the, there's a lot of different phenomenons, cognitive functions. One, people get stuck on stupid, um, their memories, how your memories are formed. That's a different one. Uh, they're one of the shootings. I can't remember. It took me two and a half years to remember a minor detail, um, that I was asking my debrief and it wasn't important detail, but I was like, I'm not going to answer cause I don't remember. <laughs> um, and it took me two and a half years to remember that in the middle of the night. So when that stress happens is that a lot of things will happen, but those two phenomena are probably the most, um, talked about that I've heard. Yeah, I would say they're the most consistent over uh, over all the people that I know personally uh, that have been in critical incidents, and over all the guests on this show. That's right. probably probably the two most most common uniform things that people experience. Um, right. We talked to two deputies from Brevard County, Florida. I'm sure you've seen the video of the guy getting out of the back seat with an AR uh, AR pistol and shooting. Yeah. They have that crazy shootout around the car, and I can't remember which deputy it was, but he he also mentioned, yeah, uh, you you forget small things or they're in your brain somewhere, but mm-hmm. you can't access them uh, immediately following uh, an incident. Or you'll watch a right. video of your own incident, and and it doesn't match up with your recollection of events exactly, yeah. Yeah. which is a which is a crazy phenomenon. So you get this uh, you get this guy in cuffs. Other units are showing up. I'm sure uh, the whole world's on its way to uh, right. off to an OIS. Once the dust settles. Uh, now there's going to be an investigation. There's going to be a post-shooting yes. investigation of you. How soon does that start? Do they take your gun? Do they replace it? Walk us through that part of the process. Yes, um, that was the part that. Uh, so I, I've always told people you have to you have to go through three different courts. One of them is going to be your department's policy. Um, one of them is going to be the state, um, the, the legal investigation. The other is your faith. Um, the state you can't control. The others you really need to. Um, as long as you follow policy, you do things righteously. You should you should be okay. And with your faith, it's just something you, that's one of the things you do get in front of early. But the state's investigation, um, this happened back in 2016, and things were a little bit weird in our city at that time. Um, some of our, some of the juries in our area, um, the grand juries were not what I would call um, the best grand juries to be picked. Um, it was actually addressed between the police and the court system as to why these juries that were sitting were so anti-police, and it was actually remedied. Um, where they went back to selection of members instead of just basically saying who wants to be a juror. Mm. But um, I say that to say the department's investigation was almost immediate. I mean, that night I made a statement. This happened at about midnight, and I say I made it home by 4.30 or 5 in the morning, um, which is pretty fast in this industry. 
Um, the state portion of it, I have a good attorney. Um, and he refused to let me sit in front of the, the sitting jury because of some things where they had ruled against officers um, that he felt was completely um, unjust. And the following grand jury that sat, again, um, one of them had actually gotten up and walked out of the court and refused to answer questions. So they were just not very pro um, police, mm. so to speak. So my grand jury took over two years before I sat in front of the grand jury. Um, when I did, we were you know, a 12 zero no bill. It was a, it was a, it was a good case. It was very cut and dry, but the, uh, that time of, of waiting of, yeah, I'm pretty sure everything's okay. But if somebody gets up there that hates the police, I might end up, you know, facing an actual criminal charge for this. Um, that was a little stressful. Um, the, the rest of it, the other things that people think they're going to have nightmares and all that, I didn't have any of that. Uh, my workouts didn't change. I didn't lose any sleep. I didn't have bad dreams. People didn't treat me differently. It was, uh, it was, um, I took my three days of administrative leave um, and came back to work and everything was good. So you didn't have any symptoms at all? No, like you said, no lost sleep, no nothing? No, um, it actually worried me a little bit that I didn't because um, right. I thought I should. And we, they, uh, they encouraged us to go to talk to a psychologist with the you know, department psychologist. Um, and as a team, we went in as a group and talked about it. And that was one of the things that I brought up as I said, Hey, this is uh, like, I feel like I might be a sociopath or right. something. Why am I not having an emotional connection to what happened? Um, and the answer was that is one of the body's possible responses to a stressful condition. And really it's because, they did a good job. The department did a good job preparing me for that day. It was not a matter of, I had to make a um, decision based on emotion. I made it on what was actually physically happening. It was a logical decision to do what I did, not an emotional decision. Um, so that's why, that's how it was explained to me. And that's what I'm comfortable right. <laughs> saying happened. Um, you did ask a minute ago, and I'm sorry, I didn't answer your question about the firearm. They did take our firearms away um, immediately. They took them that night and do all the test fire and they gave us a, a similar gun because my gun was actually my personal gun i was in a tactical unit and i was i bought my own stuff so it was my firearm but they gave me a city version of the same gun okay yeah i think it's as long as there's not a huge question about the um you know the, the shooting itself and whether or not it was justified i think it's critical to get get an officer uh, armed as, as soon as possible that that can actually create a uh, psychological uh, issue Absolutely. if they're walking around with with no gun uh, immediately after a shooting. All right. You retired uh, last year, so you were on for another five or so years after this incident. I think you had other incidents. Uh, what yes. led you to decide to go into the world of uh, training? Talk to us about that. Um, I, I've always, like I was a teacher before I was an officer, I've always liked um, instructing others. I, I really love to empower somebody to see that light switch moment where they go from I can't to I can. Um, and I went through at the city's expense, a lot of really good training. Um, our SWAT team, um, did a lot of our training and they're really good guys, um, good instructors really pushed us a long way to better, better ourselves. Um, I became a trainer for my unit, a firearms trainer for, for T-Cole, which is our governing body in Texas. Um, and I just, I really like that side of it. I like being an operator. I like going out and taking calls, um, but I really love the training side of it. Um, and the city paid for most of, I mean, they paid, I don't know how many thousands and thousands of dollars they put into giving me certificates and teaching me how to be a good instructor. Um, and that's actually what I retired to do. That's what I do now is um, I teach security. I teach you know, handgun classes. We bought our own gun range and that's kind of what I do. I love the instructional side of it. And in recent times, I've told people, you know, if you look at the stats on what crime is doing and, and um, FBI standard on how long does it take, you know, for a code one response to typically get to a, or a code three response to get to a, an incident, you're looking at a national average about seven to nine minutes. Um, and these, some of these shootings and things are over in two minutes, maybe three minutes. So I got tired of turning on red and blue lights and running through traffic just to bring crime scene tape to an event that had already happened. Um, this was more of the philosophy of my partner would always said, man, I sure wish I could have been there. This would have never happened if I'd been there, mm -hmm. but you know, they spent a lot of money training us. Why don't we train others? Why don't we teach people to be there in the moment? So that's what I've kind of moved my life into is empowering people that are non-law enforcement to have the skill sets that, that I acquired over my years of service 
so that they don't have to be a victim. John likes to say uh, when you're looking at a, a officer involved shooting or there's a gunfight going on, first things first, uh, you have all the, or you should have all the training and tools at your disposal to win the fight that you're in. And I think right. that that can apply to obviously to, to private citizens as well. If you're gonna, uh, if you make a decision to purchase a firearm and get a CCW, or if you're in a state like Texas, Arizona, where there's, you know, permitless carry, if you decide to carry a firearm, you really owe it to yourself to get training and get good training. Now, I know it's not cheap. I know it's not free, but uh, the difference between uh, no training and at least some some basic training on how to use that firearm, and more importantly, when to use that firearm. When is it right. legal to draw it? When is it legal to fire? Right. It goes a long, long way. So what sort of classes do you guys offer? Our philosophies are very in sync. Um, I, I've, I've told people that are looking at firearms um, that I can tell they're on the cusp of, you know, maybe I could do it, maybe I couldn't. I would tell them if you knew that somebody was going to encounter you today and rob you, would you rather them have a gun or not have a gun? Their answer would obviously be, well, I'd rather them not have a gun. I'm like, well, if you can't use it, why do you want to bring one to them? Mm. Don't bring the don't bring the gun. I hate to, I don't even use the word weapon. I'm the weapon. That's a gun. Um, why bring that piece of equipment into the fight if only the other person can use it? So if you don't, if you're not a hundred percent sure that you have the confidence to use that firearm when you need to and use it responsibly in a critical, you know, critical thinking time, then don't buy a gun. You don't need one. Um, that's just, um, I don't want to get into politics, but that hurts my side of politics. I think everybody that, that wants to own a gun and wants to protect themselves, every one of them should have the ability to do that. But if you don't have the ability to use it, then don't get it. Um, so that's what we, that's what we do is we try to do a real world approach to, um, well, I can, I could teach a rock how to shoot a gun. And if you want to draw a smiley face at 15 yards on a little green target, I can teach you how to do that but that's not going to do anything to help you out when that little green target's shooting back and it's nighttime and you're having to use a flashlight or a cell phone in your other hand and there's a background on it or maybe your kids are in the way or maybe it's in your home and there's there's so many different variables that you really the shooting fundamentals need to become a second nature to you so that the decision processes of do I need to even be pointing this gun at this person do I need to be pulling the trigger that needs to be what's your primary thought not oh I'm, you know was does this thing was this thing zeroed right properly last time you yeah, need to exactly. just have your gear in order you need to be ready to do it you need to, to where the only thing you have to do is make the decision am i going to or am i not going to is this righteous or is this not righteous perfect i was going to say we we like to talk about um i'm sure you've seen that continuum where you go from uh being uh, unconsciously incompetent of a skill to unconsciously competent and all the steps in between. Yep. Yeah. It's it, what you said is absolutely critical. If you don't have the unconscious complete competence with the process of drawing and firing and, and, and how your gun works and you're not confident in your marksmanship and you're not confident in the condition of the weapon, like you said, is it zeroed? Is it zeroed for this distance? Do I have a round in the chamber or not? All those things need to be something that you've that, that are uh, just like muzzle discipline or trigger discipline that you've trained so much that you can't get it wrong. You just can't do it right. wrong because it's it's an unconsciously competent uh, uh, skill set. I was asking about your training. What's the name of your facility, your company? Uh, we're in Weatherford. It's Texas Tactical Training. Um, it's uh, north of Weatherford, Texas. Nice alliteration. I like that. I'll, I'll never forget the name of your company. <laughs> so if someone wanted to come train with you how how would they go about that is there a website or social media how would they get in touch with you guys yes we do have a website um and we actually have agreements with the hotel if you want to get a cheaper stay um it's uh, texas tactical dot training is the website it's a weird it's not a dot com or dot org it's dot training i didn't even know they had one um but texas tactical dot training and then you can sign up for classes off of that website it'll put you right on the roster take your payment and all that stuff and then one of us will reach out to you um a week or so before your class and let you know last minute stuff like this is where you need to report to this is the ammo count you'll need in case you missed it on the description of the class those types of things um, and we're doing everything from i love my entry level folks I, my favorite students the one who says i i just looking at buying a gun can i borrow one of yours i've never shot a gun before i'm like oh i love this because i can i can show you right from the beginning no bad muscle memory no discipline issues you're, you're here to learn um, but anybody at any skill level. And what we try to do is work them through a level of confidence because the confident shooter is going to be a safer shooter. Um, just like the person driving with their hands at 10 and two, looking through the steering wheel, 
that sounds, you know, 10 and two, great. That sounds great on paper, but the person who's not confident behind the wheel is a dangerous driver. Mm-hmm. Same thing with a firearm. Um, it's, and it's the, don't, we like to teach people like this is a piece of machinery. It's not, there's no guns that have gotten up in the middle of the night and slit somebody's throat. They don't love, they don't hate. It's just, it's a, it's a hammer. Matter of fact, my gun got scratched. My partner said, good, your hammer scratched, your gun should be too. It's just a tool. The weapon is the person behind it. It's, it's the software, the brain. So we like to give people that type of approach to their training. Um, but yeah, as far as if you wanted to sign up for our classes, you can do that on the website and we'd be glad to have anybody, um, We've had we've got people coming in from all over the country and even Alaska that have come in to train with us. Uh, folks, before I forget, don't forget to stick around after this interview for our interview with Stephen Gatowski. The Gatowski Files, always enlightening and interesting um, and uh, fun banter as well. Uh, let, let me um, also uh, bring something up. You guys might want to consider, David, you and your team over there. Uh, we offer a class, the Active Self-Protection Instructor Development or ASPIC um, class. I don't know if you've heard of it, but I... I went through it. I still have assignments due, so I've not, I've not finished it yet. However, um, I can speak to how, what great training that is. It's really about, um, about relationships, about how adults learn. And I think any instructor, um, no matter how much experience you have could benefit from that class. So just something to think about. I think it's booked out through all of this year already, but maybe next year they'll have another cohort. I'm not sure you'd have to talk to Sam about that. Anyway, yeah, I'm bring my team in. Yeah, that'd be great. I, and last thing, I, I really appreciate you pointing out how nice it is when someone comes in and says, hey, I don't have a gun. I should get some training and then decide what kind of gun I should get. Right. Because almost invariably, the first decision someone makes about a gun is made for them by someone in a gun shop who doesn't have their best interest in mind. So right. they, they, they sell them some kind of boat anchor that doesn't do them any good. Then they have to invest in another gun once they've gotten training and realize that it was the wrong gun in the first place. Is that your experience? Oh, yes. I, uh, just the other day, and I'm not going to mention the shop's name, but had a guy selling a little old lady, kind of frail, a 357 revolver. Great. Um, trying to decide between the hammer or the hammerless. And I kind of interjected and said, um, if you have to get one, get hammerless because you won't get it caught in your clothing. But I promise you when you get broken into, that guy's going to find it in your underwear drawer. You're going to fire one or two rounds through it, and you're never going to touch it again. Um, he's selling you a surplus. You need, mm. There's a much better um, – People typically drive a car before they buy it. Right. Same thing. Go out and it's it's not try it's not possibly try the gun. Do try the gun. Go shoot it somewhere. Go to a gun range that rents them. Find one. Try it first. Experience the different calibers and how they recoil, the sizes. Think about how you're going to carry it, where you're going to carry it, why you're going to carry it, um, how you're going to keep it. You know where it's going to be loaded and where it's not going to be loaded at certain times, and then make the decision, make the purchase. Um, or you can turn around and sell me your gun for 50% of the dollar and I'd be glad to take it off your hands. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all, all good advice, uh, David. Was there anything else you wanted to touch on that I might have forgotten to, to mention? No, um, I really enjoyed um, talking with you. Some of you guys, um, I watch your channel. I watch it pretty frequently, so it was uh, good to speak with you. Absolutely, man. Thanks for coming on, and uh, I consider you a friend now, so anything I can do for you in the right. future, uh, hit me up and let me know. Thanks, David. Sounds good. Have a good one. Okay, folks, the main interview is over, so it is time now for the Gutowski Files, featuring Stephen Gutowski. He is the founder of TheReload.com and host of the Weekly Reload Podcast. You can check the Weekly Reload Podcast out on all your major podcast networks and on YouTube, where you get the podcast and clips. And if you remember at The Reload, what do you, you get it a day early? Is that right, Stephen? Yeah, if you if you're a member, you get the podcast a day early. You also get the chance to be on the podcast. We have uh, member segments uh, which are some of my favorite, actually. So today we are discussing um, a recent, uh, I guess you would say it was a, a decision by federal appeals court that revised the Smith & Wesson lawsuit against the state of New Jersey. This is a pretty um, pretty complex legal principle, but it involves the state attempting to subpoena advertising records for the company, Smith & Wesson, and what some would call an end around. Uh, Stephen, you want to explain it to us? Yeah, so this is actually very similar to the tactic we saw with the Remington Sandy Hook settlement recently, where, you know, there's federal protections for gun companies from being held liable for, you know, the criminal acts of third parties. So if somebody kills somebody with a, with a handgun that Smith & Wesson made, unless Smith & Wesson was actually involved in some way in that crime, they can't be held liable for, for that person's actions. Sort of uh, the common analogy you'll hear is, uh, is sort of like trying to hold Ford responsible 
or liable for uh, a drunk driver who, sure. you know, harms somebody while they're driving a Ford Who car. misuses their product. Right. And so because of those protections, uh, it's it's difficult to uh, try, try and attack these gun companies through through the courts now that was the whole idea of this of this federal law the pr- protection of lawful commerce and arms but there are a couple exceptions to this right like obviously you can sue a gun company if they make a defective gun uh, we've seen that a number of times sig sauer remington has been sued for, you know lots of gun companies have been sued for their products being defective just like you would for a car company or any other company that makes sure. a product uh, but you also have an exception for if a gun company violates state law. And so this in recent years has become uh, one of the new tactics being used by uh, gun control groups or victims of uh, mass shootings. Uh, They'll claim like they did in the Remington case that the gun company violated advertising laws. Uh, That's basically what New Jersey was, was trying to get at in this case with Smith and Wesson, they're, they're in best, they're trying to subpoena all of their advertising records. And in order to try and make a case against the company that gets around these federal protections, but Smith and Wesson, uh, once they got this subpoena, filed a federal lawsuit that said, uh, you know, you're violating our second amendment rights, our first amendment rights, our 14th amendment rights and, and fourth amendment rights. And so, Initially, the first federal judge to hear this case, who's an Abi- a Biden appointee, he said, he threw out the case because he said there's a, there's a special exception in, in law that says, you know, you have to go through the state courts first and make your, your pleas there before you can talk about it in federal court. Now, the appeals court has heard this case and disagreed, said Smith & Wesson's lawsuit is back on, has to be heard on the merits. And... More importantly, I think, you know, for the future of this case, the concurrence that was filed in it uh, by uh, Judge Matty was very harsh towards New Jersey and its its attempts to uh, get at Smith & Wesson's records. You know, he, he questioned the whole idea of it, saying, you know, the, this, this consumer protection law, this advertising law has been around for 60 years. Guns have been regulated in New Jersey for centuries, but now suddenly they're trying to use this law to go after Smith and Wesson and he's very skeptical of it. And he also accused them of uh, misleading the court, accused New Jersey of misleading the court by taking Smith and Wesson's advertising uh, out of context and changing the meaning. That's no small accusation, by the way, for a judge to say that. Absolutely. And so, you know, what this case, yeah, it's, it's sort of complex in terms of the, the, the legality, the law side of all of it. Um, and I'm sure legal experts will be very interested in that that part of it. But the bigger picture that's important for you know gun owners or anyone following you know these these gun lawsuits is that Smith and Wesson appears likely to win on the merits in this case if this case gets back to the same uh, appeals court panel because of what this judge said in the concurrence. I mean, you know, obviously this is not it's not a final ruling. You still have a lot of steps to go, but if Smith & Wesson wins this case, that really hurts this effort to use state advertising laws to try and get around uh, these federal liability protections for gun makers. I used to be a federal criminal investigator, and I can tell you there's a legal concept called nexus that I'm I'm confused about here. What what was the state of New Jersey? I assume it's their attorney general or Mm -hmm. state's attorney, whatever they call it, New Jersey, who, who, began this investigation what was their nexus for the initial investigation that would give them a, a need to subpoena their advertising records do we know yeah uh well so they claimed that new that smith and wesson's advertising made uh false assertions about uh for instance the the guns being the most uh precise or that here's the thing this they've never accused Smith and Wesson of any wrongdoing. This is all about inve- trying to get at the internal records, mm-hmm. right. Through this subpoena so that they haven't actually charged Smith and Wesson with violating any laws. They're investigating whether or not Smith and Wesson violated any laws by uh, making uh, claims that New Jersey feels are uh, not supported or by 
uh, uh, you know, evidence or something along those lines, claims that they think maybe could violate this state law. That's what they're looking for. And so they're, so they're going to Smith and Wesson asking for all these documents to try and find evidence that they violated the state law with some of these really fairly generic marketing claims from, from what I've read of it, you know, claiming that they make, um, you know, the, uh, pr they use precision manufacturing to make accurate firearms. That sort of claim is what they're going after, or the, the idea that firearms could make you safer. Um, you know, having a firearm could make you safer was another claim that they're in looking into as part of uh, this investigation. I mean, it's similar to the Remington case, right, where the claim was because Remington had uh, allowed, you know, allowed its the image of its guns to be used in, in a video game, and it had made an ad that said uh, man card reissued that that advertising had an effect on the Sandy Hook massacre, you know, where, you know, I think a lot of people have issue with that basic claims being made at the center of all of this. Um, and so you see the same thing repeated here in the New Jersey case of some very dubious and pretty vague uh, assertions about how Smith and Wesson might have violated this this state advertising law, which is really meant to protect against like fraud and things right. like you know people who are lying to you about what yeah, the product is. Take this pill and you lose fifty pounds overnight. You know something right. something along those lines. I got a couple things to say about this. And now bear in mind, folks, I am a podcast host, not a journalist. Mister Gatowski is an actual journalist, so he tries to avoid giving too much opinion. Uh, nothing, however, restrains me from giving mine. And there's a couple things I, w I would like to point out. One, if you, if this doesn't bother you that that a state government is basically, in my in my opinion, fishing or doing a fishing expedition or do, trying to do an end around to get at a private company, it should. I crave clarity and consistency in all things. So if this, if, if they were going after, you know, I, I won't name another company, but they're going after, you know, a, a, a company that makes, you know, um, uh, sweet sweet cakes for kids or whatever and they just decided we're going to target acme sweet cakes you know and start digging through their records that's terrifying if you're if it doesn't bother you then i i don't know i don't know what to tell you and the other thing is uh if if you think if you look at the rogues gallery of all these mass shooters whether it's a school shooter or a movie theater or what have you just look at the pictures, folks. They don't need a. They don't need an ad from a gun company to inspire them to do anything. This is not. There's there's no science. There's no evidence that I'm aware of that shows that these people who do these things are somehow affected by an ad by Smith and Wesson or by Remington or anyone else for that matter. Uh, they do what they do because they're very very troubled, and not because of any any other outside factor. I think it's. I think it's just kind of patently obvious to most people. The, that first part of that uh, is exactly why Smith and Wesson filed this lawsuit, right? They, they claim that this investigation is essentially a fishing expedition and that it violates their constitutional rights. Uh, that's what this whole federal lawsuit is about. So seeing the lawsuit revived is a sign that perhaps uh, they, they have a good chance of winning it. Let's, let's hope so. And folks, if you want more follow-up on this story, you will get it, I promise you, uh, on thereload.com. Head on over to thereload.com and consider carefully consider getting a membership. Stephen relies on memberships only at this point, and there is no advertising. There is no corporate sponsorship. There is no gun organization that's supporting his work, so he is able to give you unvarnished truth on the Second Amendment and stories around it. Also, check out the Weekly Reload podcast, folks. It's a great show. Uh, I think we see Jake almost every week, Jake Fogelman as well. Yeah, we'll have to have him on, on this show at some point. Too. I'd love that. I love that. So go over and check out the reload.com and the weekly reload podcast. It is available on all major podcast networks and the whole show and clips are available on YouTube. And if you're a member, you get it a day early folks, check it out. Steven, thank you so much for being here. Hey, thanks for having me. Hey friends, this is John Correa. If you like the podcast, if it is bringing you value, do me a favor, leave us a rating and a review. It really helps us out. 